Hi, this is Dave from Crossway Vineyard Church in Urbana, Ohio, uh, with this Kingdom Conversation. I'm really excited because joining us in this conversation is Jim Dwarning, and Jim uh, is the Associate Pastor of Vineyard Community Church in Wycliffe, Ohio, which is actually the church where Shannon and I first started our journey with Christ, like uh, the day after we gave our lives to Jesus. We went to this church, a friend of ours went there, and there was a, a tall, older gentleman in a suit that was greeting people. I thought that must be the pastor. Nope. <laughs> it was a young guy. Brent was probably in his probably early 30s. Um, and and I just really connected with her. We spent a bunch of years there serving. And um, it was just a place where we really learned uh, like what a Christian is. And we learned about the love of God. So, so this church holds a very dear part of our heart. So um, so thanks, Jim, for joining us. I'm going to throw it your way. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about the church. Yeah, thanks, David. Uh, your experience and my experience with the church have been uh, kind of the same. Uh, my wife and I uh, got married at the Vineyard back in 93. Um, I had been married before, and I had been raised Catholic, um, so we were just basically looking for a church to marry us. And if you know Brent, when we talked to him on the phone, he said, yep, yeah, we'll marry anybody. And I was like, well, I guess I fit the anybody category, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, <clears throat> if you remember when the office was back in the church itself, his little, uh, which was that side office kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Luke yeah, wood put us paneling. In I remember the oh, wood yeah. paneling. Yeah. yeah, only the best wood paneling from the 70s uh, so Lupe put us in there and uh, we were sitting there and uh, this guy walks in and he had like flip-flops and he had jams on and a t-shirt and uh, he's like hey and we're like hey and I'm like when's the pastor gonna be here and he goes uh, I am and then he just darted back out the door and I had a moment of fight or flight <laughs> so <laughs> I was I was like this this guy can't be because again being raised Catholic I uh, I was waiting for the vestment or at least the collar right um, and that was the beginning of the beginning mm. uh, so my wife and I got married there uh, matter of fact I attended the church for six years before I even said yes to Jesus so, wow. It was a, a long discipleship journey for Brent and myself. Mm. Uh, Vineyard Community Church is located in Wycliffe, Ohio, which we're about 13 miles east of Cleveland. Um, it's a small, well, small city. It's about 12,500 people. Um, it's got a large senior citizen population. Uh, it's like the, the city I live in, where the streets will never change and the house will stay the same. And, you know, the, the neighbors will be there until they decide to move. So the neighborhoods will stay the same. Um, the unique part about uh, our, the, the place the church is at, you literally go two streets over and you have half a million dollar homes. Hmm. And then you go two streets or three streets the other way and you have subsidized housing. Hmm. So we have a pretty good cross section of economic status in our area. Um, and we try to navigate, you know, we try to navigate what the community is, is all about. Um, I've been fortunate, uh, Denise and I have been a part of the church going on 30 years and, wow. uh, yeah, so we've served pretty much 25 of those 30 years. The first five years were pretty sketch. We were busy having kids and not going to church and, then got more involved and more involved and just started gleaning a heart for who God was. Um, I was raised kind of believing that God was this authoritarian, thunderous, you know, telling you everything you've done wrong. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Brent and the vineyard and, and just, you know, understanding God first and foremost um, proved to be that he's love and that he um, wants the best for us. And uh, it's just been a, a, a journey of, uh, I guess it's learning how 
to receive his love in a greater, more mm. functional way, you know, mm. and about, I went through a, a vineyard used to do something called Vineyard Leadership Institute. So I did that program in 2003, mm. 2005, I graduated, um, 2007, I was then hired by the church as the associate pastor and haven't looked back. Um, so uh, we're a diverse church. We have a lot of ethnicity in our church, um, but it's purposeful. You know, we, we try not to, well, first of all, our area is highly Catholic and you can just see that in some of the pushback that we receive just in some of the stuff that we do. But it's traditional, you know, it's a traditional kind of format. Um, but I think one of the things that we try and do is we try to reach out and meet the community where the need is. And that's been something special. Brent Paulson is our lead pastor. And he's really big on knowing what's going on outside the walls of the church as much as what's going on the inside of the church. So we take care of our people. We have a community we meet on Sundays, but I call it to, you know, people come in, we bring them in, we bandage them up, we pray them up, and then we send them out. Mm -hmm. And then we just bring them in again, you know, and our, our job is to go out and, and, you know, be that to the community. So we have all di different socioeconomic levels in our church. Um, but for the most part, you know, we're a, a man of each week, you know, looking to see that, you know, God provides and he covers. Uh, mm -hmm. We run probably the, one of the top two food pantries um, in our area, in the Lake County uh, area of Northeast Ohio. Um, so a lot of things, a lot of things going on. Um, I keep looking back. I was a, a corporate salesperson. I did relational sales for about 20 years. And uh, <laughs> I keep looking back going, where, where, where'd that guy go? You know, because mm -hmm. I still have friends in that industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I first become a pastor, I was like, they'd be like, Jim, so what are you doing now? I'm like, I'm, I'm a pastor. <laughs> and they're like, what? <laughs> we, we knew you then. How could you be a pastor now? <laughs> <laughs> which, which was a cool segue, because then I would say, you know, if, if Jesus can accept me, he can accept you, too. Amen. You know, so, uh, yeah, it's just been it's been amazing. I have two kids. Uh, they're grown. They're married. Um, my wife is really hot on the griddle for some grandkids, um, which congratulations. I forgot to say that earlier. So uh, I know we haven't talked. I don't believe or we haven't. I haven't said congrats for for becoming a papa um, it's a thing it's a thing <laughs> yeah see the pictures and uh, you don't look like it's a bad thing so no nope. <laughs> um but yeah um my life has been full i didn't meet jesus till my mid-30s um mm. and i have been in love ever since and my kids love jesus and uh, mm. we have just tried to keep our feet to the ground you know, not only doing what we do as a family, but being a part of our bigger church family. That's awesome. You know, Jim, you said something and it struck me. One of the things that we're sort of journeying in our church at Crossway Vineyard uh, that I've been asking our church is, can we, can we be, or can we grow um, in, in, in this, um, in the nature of this? Can we, can we be a space, a place that um, where people can come and belong even before they believe or even before they learn, they know how to behave in church or whatever. Can we be a space where people can like legitimately come and be a part of our community? Like they've got a place at the table. They're not living in the margins of the church. They're not like fringe, but can they, right. um, can, can we make space for people? Um, and it's, it sounds like that's your testimony. Like you were part of a church for six years, even before giving your, your yes to Christ. So that's really encouraging. Yeah, it's one of the things I think, and John Wimber thought it pretty well. He said, you, you can believe and then find a place to belong, or you can belong and then you believe from belonging. 
Yeah. And uh, just to give you a kind of a cute story was like, I remember walking into Brent's church for the first time and I was petrified. I'm like, what did my wife get me into and all of this stuff? Cause again, I'm used to the Catholic church and you walk in and you don't say anything. Mm-hmm. Well, <clears throat> there was this, uh, this little lady who came up and gave me a big, big bear hug. And uh, first of all, I was like, who are you and why are you touching me? So that was like strike two right off the bat. Well, I walk in the doors into the sanctuary and there's a grand piano, a candy apple red electric guitar and a drum kit. Now, again, I'm from a Catholic church and the only guitars we, we heard when we had 13 acoustics up there playing a guitar service, mm-hmm. this was all foreign to me. So my first thought was the bar I just left that night, the night before, kind of had a similar setup. So I'm looking in the corners of the church to see if there was like an open bar ready to go. So it was so culturally different. Mm. But what I tell people today, which I don't know if I would have gotten, well, I know I didn't even get it probably in the first 10 years of walking this journey. And it it crushes me every time because, you know, through Brent and through just all, I could name countless people. You're, you're one of the people in my life that made space for me. And that's what I think the key is making space. Yeah. And we have, we have a church full of 160 chairs, but we don't have 160 people. Mm -hmm. And the reason we don't have that many people, I I don't know why, but we we have more chairs than we have people because we're making space for the people that are are yet to be there. Yeah. And I I think that's where if you can provide an environment or you can provide a a a kind of a culture that says truly, you know, we're going to accept you as you are. Like Mm. Phil Strout would say, come as you are, but don't stay as you are. Mm. And that's where I think if we give space, if we make room for people to show up in whatever condition they are, then we have the chance to connect with them because because mess is mess, right? When we're filthy, when we're messy, it's exactly what the world is, right? Yeah. And sometimes it takes weeks to get out of that mess, mm. but you yeah. need to have a place to be able to do that. So, yeah. Sometimes years, right? Like, Oh my gosh. Pick me. Hmm. That's really good. And I, I don't want to forget this to say this, but um, also you're, you're a worship pastor and you and your daughter both are amazing worship leaders. Um, love you. you, Jim. I love your worship leading. But well, your daughter really brings it, man. She like has the vocals, but the passion because I catch you guys online here and there. And I just well, I love the I, I just love that you guys are. Um, we're very gifted, <laughs> but at the same time, like that's not the most important thing. Uh, you guys, I could tell when you're leading your church in worship, um, you're, you're worshiping. <clears throat> and I'm not like a musician. I'm not a worship leader. I can't even clap and sing at the same time. I have to stop my foot on the offbeat. I've learned, um, I, you know, uh, but like, <laughs> I'm sure there's a certain dynamics like in leading worship, I, even like in preaching, you, you're in something and while you're saying something, your mind could be thinking something else. Right. Um, probably the same thing. There's a lot that going on team wise that we don't know. Um, but you like your heart for worship keeps us, uh, keeps your church centered on 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 jesus on worship so you guys are amazing though so if like people are in the wickliffe area and you're looking for a church um in the cleveland area i would check this church out like you guys carry the heart of god in a way that is um you just carry a certain grace that is amazing so yeah thank you Yeah. yeah it's it's one of the things that i would have never even thought of when my daughter at one time, she was like, hey, dad, can you teach me how to play guitar? Hmm. And <clears throat> that whole journey began. And um, at the very beginning, I was vehemently against it only because not playing guitar, but her getting involved in the worship because I knew what the cost was. Hmm. I still know what the cost is, you know, and I didn't want to have to I, I didn't want her to have to go and pay that price. 
And then God and I had a, had a kind of a, well, he had a conversation with me and he said, basically, he was like, do you not think I'll take care of your daughter? Just like I took care of you. Mm. And I was Mm. like, okay, game over, you know, (laughs) you, but it's been, yeah, but it's been like, I, I could meet Jesus tomorrow and be completely satisfied the first time I had sang on the platform with my daughter, I I I don't think my feet touched the ground for two weeks because oh, um, what she's been able to do and what God has poured into her, and it doesn't hurt that um, she married a music production dude. So, oh really? Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, he's an amazing musician, a singer, that kind of stuff. Oh wow! Um, but it's it's kind of the you see what God's plan is and, and I I see it unfolding and what he had to do for 20 years in my life. Mm. uh, She's, she's really, it's kind of been compacted into her for, you know, over three to four years. And I I would much rather sit under my daughter's worship Mm. um, just due to the fact that she is humble and she commands just an amazing ear not only to what the holy spirit's doing but she understands our community she grew up in our community uh a pk that doesn't resent the church kind of thing um but yeah thanks for bringing that up it's it's i met jesus with a guitar on so that was really my journey to saying yes to christ um Mm. So, and music's been a part of my world since first grade. So it's, yeah, it's been a, it's been a cool journey. Yeah. Um, now uh, there is a, a topic that we brought up that we're, I want to really spend some time unpacking with you, but before we do that, um, you had mentioned the, the food pantry going on at the uh, Vineyard Community Church in Wycliffe. And, and often you guys, I know you don't seek it, but you get the attention of like the news and the newspapers. I see it. And um, it's because of the impact that you're making on the community. Um, and can, you were telling me some numbers that were pretty astounding. Um, can you share a little bit about that? How, how, how that food pantry has really grown and the impact it's been making? Uh, absolutely. You know, um, sometimes the challenge is, is that in a church environment, you you want to create the waves and you want to go out there and smack the water and say, look, this is what I see. It's happening. Mm-hmm. And we've been fortunate that Brent, our, our lead pastor, has had a heart since he has been in Wycliffe to provide food at whatever level, because in his terms, in some ways, it's a low hanging fruit, no pun intended, but it's a very practical way to connect with the community. And we have seen so many doors open, um, not only for serving people, but for, you know, just giving people a chance to find hope, hear the Mm -hmm. word of Jesus and that kind of thing. So um, when we started, when I was actually running the pantry, um, we were thankful we would get um, maybe 40 people that would come through our pantry on a distribution day. We had this basically a 12 by 16 foot room that we'd have our food in and they would come in and we would serve them. Um, and that was 2008, 2009. Um, so just let's leapfrog to uh, covid COVID was a time where we saw our numbers, well, we've seen our numbers explode just through the time of of need and all the different things that have happened economically and that kind of stuff. But when COVID hit, it was a time where we um, we actually had 12 National Guard uh, soldiers help us. They were stationed with us every week to Mm. help us move food, to transport food, we inter- we we turned our entire facility into a food warehouse, mm-hmm. um, and at our greatest number of people we served in one distribution, it was over three hundred families we served, mm-hmm. um, which for us, okay, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, that was one that was evening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and at that time, before that, our normal distribution would have been 
let's say 120 or 130 families. So still pretty large when it comes to, and again, if, if you would ever Google Vineyard Community Church of Wycliffe, you'd be like, where do you put all the people? Well, mm. it's, it's really a dance that we do on Tuesdays. Mm. But just to, to show you God's grace, because again, we run on zero budget when it comes to our food pantry, meaning the only thing the church provides for the pantry is the overhead. So mm. it's the building, you know, the electricity, what, whatever the, the overhead would be. Um, this past year, um, I, I think the final number of the amount of food we distributed in pounds was over a half a million pounds of food. Oh my goodness. That's amazing. Hmm. Yeah. So we serve, we call it a drive through vineyard or a drive through food pantry. So people don't get out of the car. We're still using the COVID protocol, not because we don't want to bring people back into the building, but because we can't serve the number of people who are coming to our pantry mm -hmm. in the amount of time that we have our pantry open. Wow. So it's, it's the attrition of not killing our volunteers mm. and yet being able to do something that fulfills the amount of time that we're available because uh, the tension we feel sometimes in the pantry is, are we a pantry that is attached like to a church or do we our church that have a pantry? Mm. and you know both can be true simultaneously but ultimately we're a church and one of our ministries is a pantry it just happens to be a pretty big one mm -hmm. you know we let's see Now, I don't want to I don't want to say any any wrong numbers but I was trying to think of some of the t statistics that um, when we were giving our final numbers to our the people who contribute to our, our pantry. Mm -hmm. But um, it's an outreach that in some ways has gotten really, really big because of the necessity. But just to give you a comparison, uh, up until COVID, the Greater Cleveland Food Bank had just an in-house pantry. And then once COVID hit, they started distributing from the Muni lot, which, you know, the Muni lot, uh, which mm -hmm. is a, a business parking lot, but it's also a huge parking lot. Well, the height of their distribution was oh, in, in a single day, they would do between 3,500 and 4,000 families mm -hmm. through the Muni lot. Yeah. <laughs> families, not people, families. Wow. Families. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, so, so the need is great. And what we're trying to do is meet some of that need. And we're trying to do it in such a way that we still honor God. So what I always say is, until God stops giving us the food, we won't stop giving it away, right? Mm. Because it's what he's called us to do. One of the impacts that we've had that's kind of a side note in this is we use either community service people from schools that need to have community service to graduate, or mm -hmm. we work with the local uh, court systems and they send community service people to us. And I can't tell you how many people walk in and they're waiting to just get land based that are, they're super embarrassed mm. and they go through one distribution and their life has changed. Well, yeah, they're seen and yeah, they're, you know, they're not only seen, but they're, they can do something. They can say what, like, yeah. so here they, they're thinking they're going to, you know, clean toilets and wash worms and do like just they, because they want to be punished. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. They show up. We love them. We thank yeah. them for being there, but most of all, they're able to hand a can of food to somebody. So the impact again, I, I love the idea that I, I love the uh, the thought that the impact of food bank or the that we're making in distributing food is is kind of a cool thing. Mm -hmm. um, the challenge for me is my heart is that we would never ever have to have that, yeah, at all, right? That we could find a way that people could um, have enough food, they could 
afford housing, they could have medical, they could have all the things that are systemic to what creates people to be in need for food. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's been a huge learning curve. The other byproduct of doing that is that we become champions for the Greater Cleveland Food Bank. And our church now has a voice. I've gone to actually Washington, D.C., and I've rallied on the Capitol and mm. spoke to our local representatives in Ohio about the need, about our clients, about all these things, which, again, was something that was never, ever looked at, right? We've had senators come to our church. We've had our local mayor comes and he helps on distribution day sometimes. So we mm. really open it up just to give people the chance to see, you know, besides like what people know us for is we're the people who cause all the traffic problems at the corner <laughs> of 300th and Ridge road. Um, which they know when to go hours, around you, they know when to go around that street, right? <laughs> well, they actually are like, what the heck are you guys? We will have people stop right in the middle of the road. What are you giving away? And it's is like, we're right? giving away food. Oh yeah. And it's like, mm. so it's it's hard hard work yeah um it's a machine my wife and the person that runs it with her right now is they're two amazing people who do a great mm -hmm. job mm -hmm. and we have you know 30 to 40 volunteers that help throughout the day to be mm -hmm. able to get us to do you know help us do what we're supposed to be doing yeah what a powerful witness for your community just meeting people where they're at their felt need um, I know when we were a part of Vineyard Church in Parma Heights, which is um, west of Cleveland, um, maybe almost the same distance that Wycliffe is from Cleveland, only the other direction. And she started a pantry and because she was very much involved in in your pantry for for some time. And um, she like it started out very small, like there were weeks where nobody would came. It was just cans of soup on a bookshelf and it grew. Right. And like God provided, like, and then we partnered as well with the, with the Cleveland food bank. And, um, and that was just a wonderful partnership, but there was a point where, um, I think they had it going maybe twice a month on a Saturday, like two Saturdays and they would feed people and then they would go through and sort of shop, you know, for their items. But, um, there was a point where, um, they think they could only, um, uh, just because uh, we were a bit limited, uh, like they would allow people to come like once a month or something, but people were coming uh, on their opposite Saturdays. And so one of the team volunteers kind of not confronted, but kind of asked them, Hey, weren't you here last time? And they're like, Oh yeah, we're not here for food. Like we just, we just love coming and hanging out with yeah. you guys. It's like, like it was uh, relationships, like real relationships were established like people weren't just numbers and that's what they would tell us. Like, we're not just numbers when we come here. You guys like, you know, our first names, you know, our names. And it was absolutely um, totally powerful. In fact, what I'm going to do. So uh, in the subject matter of the video, whether it be YouTube or Facebook down below, there's going to be a couple of links. One is going to be a link to the, uh, the Vineyard Community Church to their website. If you want to learn more about the Vineyard Church in Wycliffe, and there'll be another link specifically for their food pantry. And you, uh, I would, I would recommend praying about just supporting them, donating. Like uh, we often think, oh, I don't really have enough. Like if I don't have $5,000 to give, uh, if you do give it, but like uh, we think like we need like any dollar, I'm, I, any, any dollar matters. Every dollar donated makes a difference in someone's life. So pray about maybe um, donating, whether it be just once or even becoming a regular person that's supporting the ministry there. It's making a huge difference, and it has for years. These guys, it's, it's, a, it's a ministry. It's integrity. There's a lot of integrity. You don't have to worry about people skimming off of it. Like This goes directly towards helping the people in the community who need the help. So I would recommend that you pray about it. There'll be a link for that. So to change gears a little bit, Jim, you and I had mentioned, uh, we talked a bit about um, prior to recording this, uh, sort of like some things that what you're navigating as a church that I think other churches can very much relate to. And you had brought up a topic that I thought was really pertinent, uh, relevant, like for today. Um, can you share a little bit about that? 
Yeah, but before I step into that, just one more note from the pantry side when you're asking people to give. Um, we can buy food and we pay six cents a pound for the food we mm -hmm. get. So if you think what's $5 going to do, $5 is going to do an awful lot for us to be able to bring poundage of food in. Um, and we work very hard to keep those, those costs down. And through the, the Greater Cleveland Food Bank, we work with them too to, you know, get, uh, you know, the most efficient and the most effective way of bringing product into the church. So again, the smallest truly, truly, really helps. So, yep. um, yeah, so man, do we not live in tumultuous times? We, we do. Um, it just seems that we can take a breath and we pause for a moment and then, something else just, you know, goes off or, ex you know, explodes kind of whatever. Uh, there's a rise up in this or there's an economic collapse on the way or, you know, uh, when we looked at this year, one of the things that we really wanted to press into was, uh, first of all, we all reminisced about how much fun we had when we went through uh, the last election season. So, um, and I'm sure you know, you can come alongside and jump on that bandwagon. Uh, a, a dear pastor friend said one time, and it made a whole lot of sense. He said, it doesn't matter what decision you make, because whatever decision you're going to tick off the other 50%, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so we lived through, and we're still, I think, living through some of that tumultuous period mm -hmm. uh, when you have elections, when you have COVID, when you have the shootings, when you have uh, just what this and the truth, what the truth of the world brings to the forefront, right? So this year when we were thinking about um, kind of what kind of path we're going to set the community on, uh, visioning for 2023 and then into 2024, uh, one of the things the church came back with and it said it, it wanted us to help them with um, really working out and uh, kind of the, the series we're doing is uh, Christians living in a divided world. Mm. So how, how do we not only face division when it comes to everything from race from political, from socioeconomic, um, from family, right? When we, when we have these um, challenges that we face um, just in relational issues, right? Um, so we're really focused on um, looking at building bridges and collapsing the, thing, collapsing the things that try to separate us and want to work on bringing the communities back together, uh, whether it comes to, you know, what we're facing, even, you know, when you talk about the food pantry, when people get hungry, they're going to do desperate things mm -hmm. to find ways to get food, mm -hmm. right? So the challenging part is how do we step into this? And we're looking at really uh, creating um, and I apologize, Dave, I can't remember the exact words I have used. Um, and it's fleeting my brain right now. Uh, but kind of the, uh, the gist of where we're stepping off is we want to start building bridges and we want to start heading into uh, this political season because it's going to be among us in a very short time and how do we start conversations and how do we open topics of discussions to help people start uh, communicating together versus mm -hmm. competing or having challenges with one another. And so that to me is, I mean, there's a, there's a whole lot to unpack there. But one of the things, because we're, we live in a diverse city, 
and we have diversity within our church. It's been amazing because we've been able to have people, we've been able ourselves to open up conversations, to be able to start conversations where uh, you're, you have the freedom to be able to converse about just about anything, right? Mm-hmm. So if you have that awkward question that you need to ask that no one wants to ask, mm-hmm. that you can ask it. And there's only really a, a couple of things that we really ask people to do. One is to listen. And number two is to like respond in whatever the conversation is, but respond with respect. Yeah. So we really want to start helping people defeat or break down these dividing walls that people are building. Yeah. We want to be able to help people build bridges through communication, through relationship and provide platforms. And we're wanting to do it not only within the context of our community, but then we want to start inviting people in and start um, encouraging conversations along the way. Because I don't know about you, like I said, we had such a joyful time of people, you know, (laughs) being, you know, all the way to the left or all the way to the right or think masks were good or masks were the evilest form of punishment on the world, you know, in the world kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's how do we create a unity Mm. when there's so much that's trying to divide us? And that's really the yeah, that's really the heart of what we're, we're, like I said, we're doing a series now. That's really how do we, how as Christians do we live in a divided world? How, David, do you and I, when we can be like completely opposed in our views, mm-hmm. still walk away loving one another? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And there's there's certain things that, yeah, when we can communicate like this, I think it's an amazing opportunity because i can see you we have like the ability to talk i can read your expressions but we have this thing called the internet and we have Mm -hmm. this other thing called social media Mm -hmm. and we have like people who take on just completely different personas and feel like nothing hurts nothing Mm -hmm. you know nothing is is not to be left unsaid Mm -hmm. um and we just want to help people try to navigate that. I guess it's it's really for like, I don't know, self-preservation because <laughs> I, I, I don't have really any kind of PTSD coming up on the new elections, but we want to really try to learn from what we had gone through. Mm-hmm. And again, knowing that it was just a, a firestorm that was brewing all along. Yeah, yeah, just kind of underneath, right? Yeah, and and you know what? To to really, you know, that undergirding is how do we how do we create hmm. a unity, but how do we do it and also be teaching the 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 teachings of Jesus that are already or should be or could be new to us hmm. that have already created a platform that really speaks to all of this. So whether it's through Jesus or whether through Paul teachings, you know, I know Romans can be a a complicated book at times, Mm -hmm. but if you just take it in piecemeal, Romans is an amazing book that really, Mm -hmm. I think, speaks most importantly in a realistic way to some of the things that we're dealing with today. Yeah. So, (laughs) yeah. Um. So I don't I to to sit here and, and tell you, David, that man, we've got it all worked out and we're we're you know we're we've got this really under control is as much as i can say we've got a blueprint you know we've got some people in the works on doing some research and we are organically are going to figure this out as we go but i think if we're intentional and that's i guess what i want to encourage people with today is Mm -hmm. if you have some intentionality even about bringing it doesn't have to be racial it doesn't have to be black or white or whatever if you mm-hmm. just bring people together where there's so many more hot topic buttons that are out there right now to, to not create a, a stance that says this is right, this is wrong, but give people a chance to share, right? Share their opinions, 
you start having conversations that I think can can really help influence. Um, how do I say this? Not so uh, well to lessen the ignorance of people. Mm. One of the yeah. things I have a dear I have a dear friend. I'm, I'm sure you know her, uh, Rochelle Bishop. Mm-hmm. Um, she's a dear friend. I've known her all you know for all, all my time at the church. One of the first conversations I ever had with her, and she's African American. And I looked at her and I said, I said, Rochelle, I'm confused because I don't know what I don't know, and there's no one out there to tell me what I need to know. Mm. And she was like, what? I said, I feel like I'm tripping over my tongue because I might be afraid to say something because my ignorance is going to speak louder than what I know to be true or that I don't know what I don't know. And I'm, I would much rather have a platform on you not judging me for what I don't know, but help educate me along the way. Mm. So really for the last probably two and a half years, she's given me material to read. She's pointing me towards books to read. And mm-hmm. it's really been an enlightening eye opener when it comes to the racial division, mm-hmm. but it could be, you know, the state of what kids are going through in school today. Mm-hmm. You know, there's just craziness that's going on. Mm-hmm. Well, some people have one a, a view and one opinion. Other people have, you know, the, the complete opposite. And I, I think one of the challenges is how do we how do we marriage that up against what Jesus word is and then how do we mix in the love that God wants us to show first and foremost and then bring the teaching behind right mm. to me yeah. i often think of god is or love is the the thing that opens the door first we we open the door with love and mm. once once we can get through that door then we have an opportunity to start doing some teaching and I don't know about you, but that hasn't been true in my life. Like, like right. <laughs> early on, people would come through with the guns a blazing and then go, and by the way, remember, Jesus loves you. <laughs> and mm. I'm like, yeah. well, I have no skin left, okay, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so true. I love what you're describing, too. Even to go back to your dialogue with Rochelle Bishop, who... I think I probably know her parents a little bit more, Jan and Roland, right? Gotcha. And right. Um, so like, if she's anything like them, she's an incredible person. Um, but like, so you guys, it within, within a respectful like relationship are like navigating those differences you're learning. And um, so what, it, what I'm hearing, and what a beautiful picture of community. And what I'm hearing is like, there's this intentionality in creating a safe space to navigate those differences and to learn from one another. And I think that's one of the ways that we look a little more like Jesus, right? Absolutely. Um, And so I love that. And it's, it really is being intentional, isn't it? Because like, I think prior to COVID, like those differences existed, like we said, sort of underneath the service, but we like, for whatever reason, I think maybe too, like Jesus, it didn't catch him off guard. And like, he used these circumstances to maybe really deal with something deep in the heart of his body and the body of Christ and his church that he wanted to refine and, um, and bring love and his and holiness and righteousness to things that right. were off about us. So if that's the posture of our heart and we learn from one another, um, there's like an openness and a vulnerability to say, like, I don't, I don't have it all. Like, I don't, there are things that I just don't understand or I make presumptions uh, based on the way I was raised, where I was raised, how I was raised. Like, right. And all of a sudden, like it opens the door, the opportunity to uh, to not just like continue to develop and build a Jesus centered community, um, but like it one that looks more like him. And I think, you know, when we think about that, we think like um, 
I don't know, like it's going to be, I'm going to date myself. This is before our time, but like tiny Tim tiptoeing through the tulips. Like right. it's not that though. It's messy because it, if, and it should be um, in the sense that if we're letting Jesus into those deep areas of our heart um, that are maybe broken and um, mis- misshapen, it's going to be messy. Right. Right. Like, I don't know about you, but I've learned like I, I, I think I throw people off. Maybe there's a misunderstanding in the in churches when I say this, but I say um, like this isn't a Bible. This is actually a really good book. I don't know if you're into you two and Bono, but I would. Oh, recommend yeah. It. But like, okay, it's not the Bible, but like it's almost like if you um, if you read the Bible and you never get offended, you're really like looking at the verses you like. Like, I don't know about you, but I've been a Christian for like, it's going on 33 years. And I still look at, at the word of God and I'm like, boy, I don't like that part because <laughs> it's, right. it's it, there's a conflict in my heart. But it, rather than skipping over it, it's like, OK, God, what does this look like? And what do you mean by this? And and what does this mean for my life? Like, I, you know, so anyway, and it sounds like that's the journey that you guys are being intentional about as a community. Um, I think it's beautiful. Yeah. I think it's important. And, and you know what, too, Jim, like, I think um, when people think about the church and political seasons, outs- people outside of the uh, who aren't maybe in relationship yet with Jesus, aren't a part of a, a church, uh, they don't have a lot of good things to say. They look at what had happened and and the noise that the, the, the much of the church was making. Well, the ones that we notice are the ones making the noise. But like they look right. at that and go, I want to be a part of that. Like that's not what I see in the Bible. So like um, I think we lost some ground that way. Um, it really hurt our, our witness. So like I love that you guys are being really intentional about it. Yeah, it's – you know, I, there's 50% of me that's excited about it because it's a way to uh, create relationship and, like you said, build community. And there's 50% of me that doesn't want to turn that stone over because mm. I'm still suffering from the challenges that we faced and in some ways is still face from what we experienced before. Mm-hmm. Um, David, for me... I can't tell you the amount of close friends that I lost during COVID and during the political season that all I asked him was a single question was where is Jesus in this? Mm. And they couldn't answer me. And I said, if we're supposed to be loving our neighbor, it doesn't look like this is happening to me. Yeah. And they chose, right, in whatever they were looking or wanting to do, um, like you're saying. So, so you're going to make a decision or you're going to make a choice. And if you can create a forum or you can create a group where those things can be expressed in a safe place, you may not walk away friends still, but you're not going to walk away enemies either, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and what the the challenge or at least the thing that saddens my like my inner my my inner depths of like what what hurts my inner being is dear people friends that i've known that have walked for years with jesus over really what i would consider silly things has like we're, we're giving away just mm. like they were selling Jesus so short in the decisions they were making yeah. because of ignorance or because they decided that, you know, I'm going to support this person or I'm going to stand behind this person. Or, you know, I heard, I heard one person say that, you know, the church is faced with a really an unbeatable situation where, you know, we get to have somebody come to our church for maybe an hour and a half, two hours a week. Mm-hmm. And then they can watch the news networks for 10 hours a day. Right. Mm-hmm. So again, I don't, I don't know how it's going to turn out, but I also know that if we sit and we're humble and like I said, the idea of loving people first, 
and letting that open the door, then I think the word of God can work in amazing ways. And I can tell you just the relationship between Rochelle and I has deepened just due to the fact that, like, I know I can ask her the most bizarre, off the wall, like even stuff that would be like, am I am I going too far with this? And she's like, no, you have to ask, right? You have to ask whatever it is. And it's not a game in any stretch, but it's giving me freedom to, again, start to learn about things that I would never know about. I didn't grow up in the inner city. You know, I grew up in a suburb. I grew up, you know, in a completely different culture of white America that had no influence of what, you know, black America was growing up in. Um, so, or, you know, the different challenges if you're talking about food, there's huge issues now with subsidized feeding for the school children. So when they're in school, do they pay? Do they not pay? And when they're out of school, how do they get fed? That's a huge issue. If you don't know about it, just ask your schools, you know, ask your districts because they're challenged with it. I believe, I believe all the districts, you know, all the schools throughout the country are. So it doesn't have to be these, these, like Democrat, Republican, or Black, or White, there's, there's all of these little things, you know, that are there to help divide us where we need to create bridges to combine us. So, yeah. Um, and again, I think it's just having the will or, you know, what might be encouraging is maybe encourage, you know, if, if it's, if it's kind of stirred something up in you, uh, and you're listening to just go ahead and start praying about it you know, or bring a couple people alongside and just say, is this an area? And I'm, mm. I'm going to, I'm going to not speak for God, but I'm pretty sure God's going to say, yes, this is an area, you know, yeah. unless yeah, I see it like as an opportunity <clears throat> for like to say, okay, Jesus, what are you doing in this? Right. Like, and be about that. Like it could be a, an incredible opportunity for growth, for personal growth. Um, you know, to draw closer to Christ. Uh, and, and I think like help to develop healthy community. Um, Absolutely. I, I totally agree. I love it. Hmm. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I think I've taken up more of your time than I, then I'm realizing when I contact folks, I'm like, Oh, we'll have like a 15 to 20 minute conversation. I may need to change that that uh, approach. I don't know if you can scratch surface in 15 minutes, but um, you really shared some, some gold with us today and like some, uh, some real rich stuff to be thinking about. Um, I appreciate you, Jim. I appreciate who you are and I appreciate the Vineyard Community Church and Wycliffe. And um, again, there will be a couple links below where you can learn more about the church, but also um, pray about, uh, supporting, uh, financially supporting, whether it be one time or, or continued donation, like Jim said, anything matters. Like there's no amount that's too small, but pray about that. It's one of the ways that we can partner with the Holy spirit. Um, it's really being missional minded and partnering with the Holy spirit and bringing a life, um, to community. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And I guess just my encouragement to everybody is, you know, it's, it's in some ways, it's kind of easy to sit here and, and just be able to have a conversation and on the outside listening in, it'd be like, oh my gosh, they're on this path, they're on this line, and they're heading in this direction. And, and yeah, I think 30 years in ministry, or at least for me, being in the church 30 years, is, I've gleaned a lot to, to know that that's an important part. But my encouragement is to, to just begin something. You know, if it's just beginning to pray, that's that's huge. You know, the yeah. other thing is to go out and talk to your talk to your local your your local city people, talk to your mayor, talk to the superintendent, talk to to your uh, what is it like your your senior community center if you have one, or if you have a community center that that has kids come in, mm. because you're not going to need to look far to find a need. 
mm. that the church can start reaching out. I, I know you, Dave, when, when Brent first got here and started with the vineyard, it was in some ways, I don't want to say just as easy, but it was pulling two pickup trucks and throwing mm. groceries in the back and then heading downtown and, and handing them out to people as they were walking by or the King's banquet, you know, mm. where we just clothed, you know, handed out clothes and we handed out food and we, you know, so those are the kind of things that I think show the real heart and the real love. And that gives the, the bridge mm. to be built to then start to share the message of Jesus Christ. Amen. So it's, it's yeah. that whole, caught and not taught or sometimes it's taught mm -hmm. and then caught and mm -hmm. um but yeah back to you guys i appreciate you dave and uh my love to shannon and all that you're doing in urbana and uh keep up the great work and i just pray blessing on everything that you put your hand to oh thank you yeah and to piggyback uh, as we close this up um with what you're saying like if you're watching this, I, cause I, you know, I know, I, I know you've, you know, the heart, a lot of pastors desire, like just feel pigeonholed by what, for whatever reason I uh, can become paralyzed and, and think what difference can we make? Um, no matter how big or how small your church is, your group is start with who you've got and what you've got. Like I like the illustration of Moses who started with a, with what he was, he, what was in his hand. So like, right. what, what has God put in your hand today and be faithful with that. And you guys are a prime example of, of how God grows that in with faithfulness. And um, I've, over the years, I've talked to a lot of pastors who are like, well, you know, we, we love, we want to do outreach, but we just maybe don't have the people or we, we don't have the resources you know, yet, but hopefully someday. And, and, and what I've said to them, and I think it's got mixed reviews, but what I've said is whatever <laughs> you're doing, yeah, whatever you're doing today, as you grow in, in people and resources, you're going to do more of tomorrow. So if you're doing absolutely nothing today, you'll be doing absolutely nothing, more of nothing tomorrow when it comes to outreach. So um, start with what you've got, who you've got. And like for us, um, this will be our, we've got an outreach this Sunday at, or in Urbana. And we're doing, we're going back to the old days of just taking groceries door to door. And um, in some really under-resourced areas of our community, just starting with, with what we have and who we have and, and believing that Jesus loves people enough to use uh, a bunch of motley people like us to do it. Amen, brother. Awesome, Jim. Well, hey, thanks for taking time, and um, hopefully it's been an encouragement for folks. And uh, looking forward to connecting um, when I'm back up in Northeast Ohio again, hopefully sometime soon. Thank you. God bless. You too.